which are the training objectives. So, I want you to know uh, when, you, when we complete, you complete this training, everything that uh, relates to engineering of oil and gas facilities, so how engineering is developed, basic different phases, basic engineering, feed, and detailed engineering. Okay. So that's a big program, because as you know, it's a co rather complex process. There is a lot of disciplines involved. Okay. And of course, the matters are very technical. One of the, maybe in my speech, in my le lecture, you will sometimes find that uh, I go too much technical. Uh, in this industry, my experience is if we want to make a difference, we have to be technical and highly precise. We cannot just be uh, on the surface of things. So, in fact, at some, when you feel like I'm really going technical, please bear with me, uh, since again, what I'm, uh, my experience is you need to know, I wouldn't say details, but you need to, do, to know uh, specific technical things, otherwise you are missing the, missing the point. I just take a small example, a pump, you know a pump. Okay, a pump performs a process duty. It brings so much uh, cubic meters an hour of fluid of this density, this viscosity from this pressure to that pressure. Fine, okay. But if I stay at this level, I have only defined the functional requirement of the pump. But you'll see that there is a lot of more things that come with the pump. For example, the sealing system, you know. And uh, probably the sealing system, in some cases, it, it, it represents 20% of the cost of the pump, right? So you might consider that a pump is just here to pump uh, liquid, but when you are an engineer, you need to consider uh, other things because they are very important for this equipment. Okay. So, uh, that's why, that's what I wanted to say. Don't be uh, upset if I go to some things that appear to you may, a bit too technical. If I mention these things, it's because I think they are valuable. Uh, I, yeah. This training will cover onshore and offshore. Okay. Facilities. The format of the training. Okay. So, um, as you've seen, as everybody has seen, there is a textbook uh, which is the frame of the course. So, my objective is to walk you through the training course and using this as a guideline. Which is the purpose? Is that you can, you get familiar with the information on this material. Uh, it contains everything you should know, at least uh, from my perspective about uh, engineering and engineering management, where that's maybe too much, but too much, but this is really um, the, if you know this, you are part of the top 5% project engineers, okay? And that's all you need to know. Uh, so, uh, I tell you that, I mean, after some, uh, so many years in uh, major EPC contractors, unfortunately, very few people uh, know uh, all these things. So if you do, you're uh, part of the, of the top. Okay, so basically that's, uh, that's why the agenda for the training will basically uh, mirror that of the book. So if we take the table of contents, 
we, you will see that we will, uh, okay, so what, what, uh, what, is, uh, what is the agenda? First of all, we will, I will make some introduction about project engineering, project development phase, what are the different uh, uh, disciplines, the organization of engineering, kind of general topics, okay, because we need to have some general information before we get going to more specific ones. Then we will wrap up the design basis. What are the base information we need before we start? It's a very, very important uh, point. Then we have the discipline review. So we will go through each discipline because I want you to understand the work and the deliverables of each discipline. Okay, so safety, mechanical, piping, civil, whatever. We will go through each of them and I will explain what they do, how they do, and what they produce. Okay. Fine. The disciplines, so that will take us up to number 12. I will say a few words about the specificities of offshore uh, facilities. And then we will see because the disciplines, they don't work in isolation. They work together, right? As you know very well, they are very interconnected. So we will see how the whole process works, including the interface between disciplines. As you see, as you know, in engineering, a lot of disciplines are getting their inputs from others. For example, piping. They can't work before they have the PNIDs, which they receive from which discipline? Process, fine, okay? That's one example, and there are thousands of such examples. So there is a lot of uh, interconnections. That's why we need to understand the overall picture. And so we will do that, and we will have a, a lot of um, exercise to make sure we understand which discipline depends on which, which other. Okay, and uh, once we have done that, I will give you tips how to manage engineering activities. Okay, so what controls to put in place to establish true progress? What are the methods you should uh, use when there are changes in the design and so on? And I will explain also what are the uh, main aspects of the time schedule, the project time schedule, and what engineering must do to support the time schedule. Any questions so far? Please feel free to... Uh, you don't have to wait till the end of the session to ask questions. Just don't, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. So where do we start? And we start with the way engineering is developed. So when uh, an oil company, oil and gas company, wants to develop a new facility, what are the different steps? Okay, the first one, and then the other one I will let you guess. I, I, I just give away the first one, is basically the business, business planning let's say, phase, business planning phase, where we identify a business case, uh, with a market, you know, with, uh, I mean, this is general topic. Yeah. Uh, we have, um, we establish economic evaluation. Uh, for example, if we have a, 
if we want to build a new unit in a refinery, we make uh, basically the economics of, uh, okay, we can, or we have a constraint, for example, uh, we have a new requirement in terms of uh, product specification in a refinery, we have to then, uh, no choice but to develop another unit to match this specification, or otherwise there is, uh, for example, exploration, we have ex made some exploration, we have to develop a new field and so on. So that's the business planning phase, which define the broad input, the broad objectives of the project, okay? So basically, uh, in this, we have the feedstock, we have the products, basically that's, uh, we know what we need to do, what is the, uh, what is the business case we have to process the feedstock into a, a required product, for example, crude oil, to bring it to the market in this quantity, at this location. Okay, then, so this is part of the oil company, this is done by the oil company, okay, by the client. I will refer to them as the client. Any one of you from the client side or all from contractors? One, okay. So, then what happens? What does the client do when they want to go one step beyond? Well, they need to know how much it's gonna cost the development because, you know, uh, to know if it's a, if the net present value, as we call it. What is the net present value of the project? You need to know how much is the investment cost, how much is the operating cost, and the revenues, and you need to know if it's profitable. So for this, they need to know what is the capex and the opex, what is the capital expenditure and the operating expenditure for the facility. So they need to develop the design. So they go into the first stage of the design. Anybody knows what is called this first step? Sorry? Yeah. So, feasibility study, conceptual, or basic design. Okay, it all means the same thing. And what, what does it, uh, so, let's start by the objective. What is the objective at the end of this, fa of this phase? It's to basically confirm the feasibility, yeah, as you said, huh? uh, establish, uh, so confirm, confirm the technical feasibility, but in, in, uh, in many cases there is no really big issue on this. And the main objective will be to estimate the capex. The first estimate of the, you know, the capex, everybody understands, so the total estimate of the total installed cost of the facility, okay, with a certain level of accuracy. At this stage, it would be plus or minus 30%, okay? Why? And I come back to the, I, I have not yet uh, defined everything, why we need to, to, uh, to define the capex at this stage to know if we, go, if we continue or not. Because then we will check with this capex, okay, is the project, the contemplated project profitable or not? If it's not, then it will be done. And if it's profitable, then the next step will be started, okay? And the next step is called the fee, the front end engineering design, okay? Where we will go uh, significantly further in the design. 
Okay? Why? Because at this stage we want a precise estimate of the capex because so precise estimate because at this stage we will make the what is called the FID. Everybody knows what is a FID? Yeah, final investment decision. Okay? And then we will go into the EPC and which will include the detailed engineering. This is just because we are talking about engineering phase. But this is the EPC phase. Okay? Okay, now. And the level of accuracy we need here at the end of the feed in terms of cost, which level of accuracy of the investment we, are, uh, we want. Yeah, right, 10%. So, let's review what is the content of basic and fee. And then detail. Well, the content of BASIC is quite simple. It is whatever is required to come up with a plus or minus 30% cost estimate, period. So we won't go any further than what is what info, technical information we need to reach this what does that mean? It means we will only do process engineering. So we will develop the process scheme. So we will define how we can turn the feedstock into the required product. So basically at this stage, we will develop Process simulations, process flow diagrams. We will see this with more details later on, but I just anticipate a bit. So process, so process simulations, process flow diagrams, and the heat and mass balance. And basically we will do some, we'll produce an equipment list. Equipment list. Which will be sized. We have a sized equipment list. Sized, it means the duty of the equipment will be indicated. For example, a, a compressor, we will indicate if it's 10 megawatt or 25, right? Okay. Why? Because this will allow us to calculate the estimate of the capex with this accuracy. Then you know. The rest is, uh, so basically, how does it work? You estimate the main equipment, okay? And then to estimate the rest, you use some factorization for the environment, okay? For example, the piping around equipment, you estimate as a percentage of the weight of the equipment, uh, the same thing for the civil and so on. Okay, so basically, basic design is mainly, is mainly, yeah, is, oh, is process engineering and it results into uh, your process design up to the sized equipment list. Any questions? Some companies do this step internally. Total does, for example, and some 
use contractors to do it. Okay, so once the gate has been uh, passed here to feed, so the front end engineering design. Yeah, here I didn't mention, but we can also study alternatives here. Study and compare alternatives. There can be different types of process to achieve the same result. Huh? We can uh, to uh, optimize the cost. To, uh, for example, one train or two trains, pros and cons, right? Okay. This is at this stage that you take these decisions. Here it's too late. You have decided you go one option. So, feed stage. Okay. Basically, the feed stage. I was already mentioning, is to produce everything that needed to get a precise cost estimate. So in this case, all disciplines are involved. Not only process, but plant layout, mechanical, uh, civil, instrumentation, and so on. Okay? All disciplines, because these guys they need to produce the list of materials, you know, so the specs and uh, BOQs, bill of quantities, in their respective disciplines to enable the cost estimator to come up with the plus or minus 10% cost estimate. That is not the only objective of a feed to calculate to have a plus or minus 10% cost estimate. What other objectives? What are the other objectives of a feed? Everybody, anybody has, has been working on a feed? Never? Nobody was ever involved in a feed? Okay. What happens after a feed? After a feed and the final investment decision, here there is a call for tender, or maybe it's, it's in between, by the way, it's at the same time. There is a call for tender for the EPC, okay? So that you've been involved in the bidding phase, right? So, in order to make a call for tender for the EPC, what do you need here? Ah, you need quite a number of documents, right? Yeah. So, this is the second objective of the feed, is to produce all documents, I put an X, I call them X, required by the EPC contractor to make a lump sum turnkey bid. That's Second objective. So, you need to develop, for example, a plant layout for, to show to the contractor how many decks, how many modules, for example, if I talk about offshore, FPSO, how many modules, how many decks, uh, to develop an electrical distribution diagram called single line diagram. Uh, of course, PNIDs. So at this stage, we were at the PFD level. Here we are, of course, at the PNID level. Okay. And uh, you need to develop mechanical specification for equipment. At this stage, there was a vessel that was four meter in diameter and the separate production separator four meter in diameter and twelve meter long. At this stage, you need to define. It will be in uh, AA 516 grade 60, and uh, it will be uh, 25 mil uh, thick, and uh, uh, NACE uh, compliant, and, uh, and blah, blah, blah. To get a precise quote, you need to specify this equipment. So, mechanical gets involved, layout, and uh, electrical instrumentation, 
everybody, okay? Because you, as an EPC contractor, you have to make a bid. How can you make a bid without a set of PNIDs showing the instrumentation that is required? How you can make a bid without a layout showing the number of levels uh, and the position of the equipment and the routing of the pipes and so on? There is another thing that uh, is not mentioned here is in doing the fit stage, you also prepare normally. What, what do you prepare? To anticipate. Any idea? What takes a long time in a project? How does it call? Long lead items. You heard about those guys? Turbo compressors, you know? All the turbo machineries. These guys, you know? You need to order them much in advance. So, at this stage, you prepare the requisition, material requisition for the LLI. In fact, sometimes the company buys the LLI. And uh, so then they become company provided items, CPI. But anyway, uh, you have to prepare the inquiries for the LLI, issue the inquiries, get the bids from the vendors, clarify the bids, be ready in the first few months of the EPC to place the orders for the LLI. So LLI activities. Sometimes, not for offshore, but sometimes for onshore, you have also, you have uh, as well, sorry, you have also the early works. If you have to grade the site or something, you can develop that at this time. The drawings for the early works, because you can get going with these early works ahead of the uh, EPC contract. You know, and uh, so, yeah. Then we move into EPC, hopefully the, there is, uh, you are awarded the contract, then we move into the EPC phase and the detailed engineering that you probably uh, uh, are more familiar with. And uh, detailed engineering, bah, it concerns all disciplines and uh, you go and you produce basically two things. Huh? Engineering produces basically two things documents for the procurement to purchase and documents for the construction to fabricate and erect. Okay, so documents for procurement to purchase, it's basically the material requisitions and then uh, documents for, the, for, for construction, uh, it will be, uh, well, you, you know very well, all, all the construction drawings and specifications as well. Any questions on this phasing of a project development? You see, each step at a time, and then we, we have a gate. Here we have a first gate, do we go for a feed? Which is, a feed is like two, three percent of the total investment cost. If you have, if you have a one billion, you know, or let's say, no, something more reasonable. Let's say, a, a two billion, two billion US dollar project. You know, fee is already something around 50, 60 million USD. It's quite a lot of money, huh? So, 2 billion USD is like a FPSO, a, well, you know, maybe two, two and a half, three, okay? So, uh, you decide here at this stage, you decide do we go to invest 50 to 60 million USD? So that's his decision. And then, of course, at this stage, it's uh, the overall investment decision. One more thing. All of you are offshore, maybe, or some are onshore. Onshore? If there is a process licensor, you know a process licensor? Some units in refinery, not in offshore, not in production. In production, all the processes are open art, what we call open art. There are very, very few on their own license. And, uh, yeah, 
So forget, let's not consider that. But refining, in refining, processes are under license. For example, you have a hydro treatment process under license of IFP or Accents, which is the IFP process license or the brand name. Okay, fine. So in this case, at this stage, you have to involve the process licensor because part of your process, the process of certain units, is coming from the process licensor. Okay? That's just, I just wanted to mention that here, not to forget that. Okay? Clear? So you have a refinery, big refinery with uh, 20 units, maybe two of them or three of them or more are under license, process is under license, you get the basic information, you get the basic book, which is all this, not from your process department within your engineering company doing the basic, but from the process license. Clear? Don't hesitate to ask any question. I can tell you that uh, it takes, it takes a long time when you come into the industry to understand this. You know, even today, you come across, I come across people that confuse, uh, talk about feed and uh, basic. They don't know. They don't know what it means. You know, a lot of people, they use the words, but they don't know what it means. <laughs> so they use the words, it's a clear they, they know what they, they, but they don't know. Okay? So you see, it's important to have uh, this, this uh, clear in your mind. I want to say a few words about how engineering is organized. So how uh, basic or feed or detail, you know, the engineering organization in, uh, within contractors, how does it work? Well, it's organized by <laughs> discipline, okay? And it's coordinated. And the discipline work is coordinated. So we have the engineering manager, and then we have the various disciplines, such as process, uh, equipment, mechanical, piping, and so on. Huh? I don't, we have them in the page eight. Huh? Well, no, maybe, well, no, we will come to that later. Sub-disciplines. After that, I'll show you the usual sub-discipline sub uh, distribution because, for example, in equipment mechanical, you will have subdivisions, you know, you will have static, you will have rotating, and so on. So, but I, I will discuss that la later on when we go into each discipline. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so the engineering manager. A couple of things I want to I want to mention here. So, how how disciplines are organized? So normally you have a lead discipline engineer. Probably some of you are, they know all this, huh? but just for everybody to just lead discipline engineer, which is the head of the discipline, and then there are engineers. Okay. So that's for process. For in the other disciplines, you have the lead discipline engineer. And you have engineers, you have designers, and you have draftsmen. Okay? So the lead discipline engineer is a senior guy in the, in the team that can uh, oversee the work of all the others. Huh? Uh, if you take, for, for example, civil, uh, it's the same distribution. So basically, you have the engineers, the engineers, they are the ones that do the calculations, they do the conceptual design, the calculations, and then you have the, uh, you have the designers that uh, use the calculations uh, from the engineer, and they 
uh, produce the drawings uh, by assigning work to the draftsman. Okay? So this is in terms of, this is the seniority levels you find. Is that the organization you're familiar with? Yeah? Okay. Uh, what else to say about the, yes, important things to say about the organization. You know, there is not even one person to do all the coordination, you, as you imagine. So, here I will describe, I will describe uh, the common, the organization I've seen in the EPC contractors I work with, the engineering manager as assistant, which are called the project engineers, okay? So the project engineers. And I put a plural because they are, uh, on a large project, there will be many of them, okay? So what, what do you think their task will be of these guys, project engineers? I will give, give you some uh, uh, organization that I've seen was particularly eff effective. Okay. Some are assigned specific roles, such as, you will see later in, the, in this course, I will explain how important it is to place the purchase orders of the main equipment at a very early stage of the project. So, within... Uh, leading EPC, Western EPC <coughs> contractor, one project engineer was assigned to equipment. His task was to make sure equipment were specified and ordered on time. Major role. Then, once you have ordered the equipment, you have to make sure that you will be on time with your bulk materials, in particular piping, because piping, this is a, this is a the driver. So there was another project engineers that were, uh, engineer that was assigned to bulk materials. In fact, to pulp piping. So you see, you assign your project engineers to some priority that also are coordinating, because to order your piping, you need to have the PNIDs frozen, you need to have the plant layout frozen, you need to have the material specifications available and so on. I will come back in detail, but you see, coordinative roles. One of the EPC contractors also had a cost killer project engineer. His name was not exactly that. He was called the material manager. Material manager also called cost killer. His role was to go to each discipline and challenge them about their design, was it optimized, the specification of materials. Okay? Uh, some other uh, tasks that were given to uh, project engineers. Usually, you'll find one is assigned to a HAZOP closeout, 3D model closeout, Sometimes interface with a certification party, DNV, you know, for offshore vessels. So interface with a third party. One could be also allocated to interfaces, but that maybe not on the engineering level, but on the project level. So interface with third party for the design. You know, when you have your class vessel classification uh, to achieve, you have to give a number of documents related to safety, uh, to uh, a class certification body. So you have to interface with these guys because you have to submit drawings and get their approval and so on. Is that also the way you are organized with some uh, project engineers like this, assisting the engineering manager on specific topics? Okay, so that's the organization of the team. Last thing of this uh, introduction, uh, and I will be finished with the generalities, but we needed to explain a bit the overall picture. It's the, the product of engineering is documents, right? Only documents. So, one important thing is to get oriented throughout these, these documents. 
So first of all, bad news. There are, on a typical job, as you know, thousands, tens of thousands of documents. But now, good, good news, there are only a few types of documents. And even better news, all the different types, they are shown in the book. So, you know, like isometrics, you have thousands of isometrics, but uh, okay, they are all isometrics. So, once we have described one isometric, you will know what is, an, uh, what is uh, 10,000 isometrics, okay? So basically, in the book, I made it a point to put every common engineering deliverable in each discipline. To be able to easily identify documents, there is a codification that contains at least an identifier for the discipline, another one for the document type, and then a serial number. So for example, P3, uh, and then a serial number are process diagrams. P4 are process data sheets. So, easy. Some EPC contractors are more clever. What they do? That's a very powerful thing. They add, not only they put the discipline, so this is discipline, huh? this is doc type, you have some uh, list in the, on the page 9. Huh? And then you have the serial. But what did they do? They put here M and then serial. M is material code. Uh, of course, before you add the project number, huh? let's say P is a project number, job number. Huh? Okay, forgot to mention. The material code, what is this? This is a genius thing. It is, for example, if you have a skin thermometer, skin thermometer, very precise, it will be 17570. If you have a globe valve, it will be one. So 17 is the family instrument, 13 is the family piping. One, three, four, two, zero. That would be a globe valve. That would be a skin thermometer. So, have you seen this? Has anybody seen this material code? You know what is the role of this? It's very powerful. I come to any project. I want to see in the previous project, I want to find the documents related to a particular commodity. For example, centrifugal pumps. Okay, centrifugal pumps, which is the material code? Material code for centrifugal pumps is 09400. Okay. I go to the document library and I get all the documents with material code 040800 and I obtain immediately all documents on centrifugal pumps. And besides this material code, they are also used for costing. So you get the cost in the cost breakdown, the cost controller, it can give you the cost by material codes. So, very powerful. Okay, so, codification. Well, we've reached the end of the general generalities. So now, it will be up to you to work 
a little hands-on activity. So I'll ask you to have this exercise book. So in this, basically, I collected some of the some exercises. Huh? There is a how many? I use 16, 16 of them. And, uh, and then uh, some exhibits, some drawings that uh, was uh, quite uh, also interesting to, uh, to have a look. So we will see that later on. For the time being, I invite you to go to the first exercise, which is the basic engineering design data. So what is this document? So here I've reproduced the table of contents of this document and I want us to fill it. Let me explain. At the start of an engineering activity, you need to make sure the basic data that you need to develop your design is available. That is the data that all disciplines will take as a reference. Okay? So one of the tasks of the engineering manager is to make sure that this data is defined. So let's, uh, let's identify this data. So please uh, take this page and uh, you have a few minutes. Uh, think what everything you need to start the design. Think of a pre precise project uh, that you have been working on. The, the reason is you will be uh, probably in a position at some point to receive such document with design basis and you will have to screen it to check if there is everything or not and then request the information at the kickoff meeting. You know, huh? before the kickoff meeting you have to check that you have everything in hand and if you are missing information you need to request them, right? So that's the purpose of this exercise. And if some of you have a, uh, trouble starting from a blank page, I just give you one item just to get you started. One of the things you need is are site conditions. You know, air temperature uh, and so on. Because you need to design like air, air coolers, you know, okay? Air, air cooled uh, heat exchangers. So for this, you need to have the air temperature. Also for the insulation and so on. Uh, for the, this impacts a number of uh, items. We will take the case of, uh, because this is more uh, comprehensive, we take the case where we add one unit to an existing facility. Okay? Because this is, a, this is a better exercise than to do for a brand new facility. Okay? So the exercise is you have to add a unit in an existing facility. Okay? And this is, please list the data that you need uh, to do the design of the unit. So usually you'll find, when you are an EPC, you'll find that this document has already been issued during the feed stage, okay? So it can be called different names. The most common names will be basic engineering design data or simply engineering design data or general design criteria, something like that, you know. But the thing is, it has to be uh, one document that each discipline will refer to and also 
you will find that this document is quoted in, uh, for example, material requisitions for equipment vendors, then they will all refer to the same data. For example, if you have, I mentioned the site condition, the air, maximum air temperature, they will all refer to this same data. It will prevent having discrepancies. Okay. So, who wants to start? Who wants to give some, uh, some information that is to be found in this document? Yes, available utilities and their conditions. Do you have cooling water? If you have in the desert in Saudi Arabia, you don't. So you have to mention that. So what are the available utilities, steam and so on, that you have at the plant and at which battery limit, pressure and temperature? Fine, good. What else? Yes, wind, ah, wind speed, and also wind, seismic. seismic, wind speed and wind prevailing direction. You will see that this has a very big impact on the plant layout, surprisingly, but wind direction. Okay, seismic, temperature, maximum ambient, minimum ambient, Ah, okay. MDMT. MDMT, do you know what that means? Minimum design metal temperature. That's for equipment. Okay. So, uh, and you know how it is specified, MDMT? It is at least the minimum ambient temperature. Let's say we are here in Seoul. I don't know what is the minimum ambient, maybe minus 10. I don't know. You will have pressure vessels, steel structures, at least designed for minus 10. But this is not necessarily the MDMT because suppose there is a pressure vessel with NGL under pressure. If you depressurize this vessel, you will have lower temperature than the ambient temperature because the product will vaporize and it will create some uh, cold, uh, it, uh, cold temperature. So the MDMT that we specify on the data sheet of a vessel, it's the minimum of the minimum ambient temperature and the temperature reached during depressurization by auto refrigeration. So, in, in fact, this information, MDMT, will be specified on the data sheet of equipment. Why? Because it could be different for each equipment. As a rule, it will be the same for all, except the ones that contain products that can bring the temperature very, very uh, low during depressurization or gas, high-pressure gas, you know, when you have high-pressure gas systems, uh, you will find that the vessel will be in low temperature carbon steel because of the depressurization, not because of normal operating temperature or site condition. For example, offshore, it's very warm offshore. Well, in some like countries like Middle East, Africa, it's warm, but still the vessels, they can go to minus 30 degrees when you depressurize very quickly because offshore you have rules API rules that say you have to depressurize to 7 bar in 15 minutes. You can imagine if you depressurize gas at 100, 200 bar in, uh, in 15 minutes, you get very low temperature. So, <laughs> sorry to be a bit long, I want it to be precise. On the, so in this document, you'll find the minimum ambient site temperature, which still determines the type of steel you will use. Uh, and the uh, and the maximum uh, maximum okay so site conditions what else we will find so yes of course product specifications yes <laughs> feedstock composition 
and condition, composition, uh, number of uh, percentage of uh, various components, condition, pressure, temperature, also variation, like if you take in a, let's say an oil field, for example, you have several years, uh, you have an operation envelope, so you will have not only one case, but several cases, okay? Uh, the flow of the feedstock, the turndown of the unit, what is a turndown? Anybody? Turn down. It's the unit rangeability. It shall be able to operate from 100% to 50% of the design flow, for example, or to 30%. It makes a difference for the equipment because uh, sometimes they have trouble to operate at a low turn down. Huh? Okay, good point. What else do we need as a starting point? Ah, yes, 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 exactly, scope of work. <laughs> now, you know I'm French, huh? so I, I'm not, uh, you know, we are both uh, speaking a foreign language, don't worry. Huh? It's, uh... <laughs> so, uh, yeah, overall scope of work, huh? description of the plant. Yes. What else? Yes. If we have to use the bloody British units, huh? inches and uh, pounds and terrible, or we can, uh, yeah, even worse, the US, US gallon and uh, <laughs> terrible. Okay, units of measurement, yeah, that's, you know, because we are, we are laughing, but you know, if I uh, issue my data sheets, with the wrong units of measurement, you know, and there are some very uh, tricky ones, huh? for, uh, for example, uh, fired heaters, you know, million uh, BTU, blah, 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 you know, or uh, megawatt, or million kilocalorie per, it's a mess. Huh? So you need to make sure, you agree with the client, this goes to the client for agreement. You need to make sure, okay, on my data sheets, I will use these as units of measurements. If you work in South America, they will ask you sometimes to put the US uh, stuff, you know. So, weight in pounds and stuff. Okay, what else do we need as a starting point for engineering? Design life. Yeah, design life. Okay, design life is, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm laughing because this is something I often want ask myself, I say, okay, Design life 20 years or 25 years. Okay, I read this in the contract and say, okay, but what do I do with this information? You know, you can say, okay, 25, 20, you can say 30. I don't, you know, I won't be there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I will be six foot under by the time. No, but I, I'm wondering, what what do we what do I do with this information? Whether whether I say 20 years or 25 years or 30 years, what you have any idea where? Does it impact the design if there is one area where it impacts the design? Yeah, can you be more precise? Yeah, right, exactly. So when you calculate the corrosion allowance, when uh, the corrosion, not allowance, the corrosion, uh, you calculate number of uh, millimeter or of wall thickness loss per year, and you, calc you multiply by the life, design life of the facility to find out how much residual wall thickness is there after 25 years or 20 years. Yeah, that's correct. So for instance, uh, at the present moment, my company is delivering uh, uh, a plant uh, for um, a BOT, build, operate, transfer. You build, you uh, operate for five years, and then you transfer. Basically, the design life is, uh, that you care of is basically five years, you know. So uh, you, could, uh, you could say, okay, I'm gonna calculate everything that they last for five years. In theory. You know. Well, that's not what we are doing, but anyway. Uh, okay, I anyway, it impacts, and you know, uh, thickness of uh, pipes, it means uh, welding time and all, all blah, 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 not, uh, you know, okay. 
Uh, I'm sure you know m much more than me because a lot of you are involved in very uh, in uh, construction origin companies uh, more than engineering. Okay, uh, wh what else did we forget? Applicable codes and standards. Uh, yeah, that's very important, you know. Applicable company specifications. Because you know, the clients, even though there are industry codes and standards, very good ones, look at the API. Very good codes, very comprehensive. But still, the clients, they have their own referentials. Terrible. With thousands of specifications, each specification, several hundred pages. It's a nightmare for everyone. Huh? So there are Shell, Depth, there is a Total GS, there is a, all of them. They couldn't avoid to have a, a technical referential. So we have to put up with that. So applicable company specs. So it means when we issue an inquiry for an equipment, instead of being able to issue three, four pages, we have to issue 10 documents with all the company specs. It's, uh, it makes the process very, uh, very heavy, but at this moment, it's still the norm, still the norm in the industry. It will probably change because uh, the oil companies cannot afford anymore to, to have such high prices and uh, schedule delays, which is uh, in large part uh, due to their specifications. Creates a lot of hurd hurdles along the way, all these uh, company specs. Okay, what, what else we find here? We find local rules, local rules. Sometimes we have local laws. For example, for civil, civil they are involved, you know, they have to comply with local rules. Of course, if you, have, if you are offshore Nigeria, you don't have much, you don't have any local rules. Makes your life easier. But uh, in some uh, developed countries, there are local rules you have to follow. So they have to be identified. Uh, okay, I mentioned this project was the addition of one unit in an existing facility. So you have to define the battery limit conditions. You have to specify also, so somebody said the product specifications. Sometimes you have also uh, performance, like energy performance or some other. Uh, you have emissions, noise, you know, emissions. If you have uh, exhaust from a turbo machinery, or uh, fired heaters, you know, how much NOx you are allowed and blah, blah, blah. So these things have to be uh, specified here. Yeah? So uh, NOx, CO. Sometimes, but I don't like that. It's not very good practice, I don't think. In this document are also the design criteria in the various disciplines. But then it makes this document bulky and it's better to ask each discipline to issue its design criteria and get it approved by the company before they start their work. And that's it. It never happens, but uh, it should be like this, you know. Normally, you should uh, uh, issue design criteria. Okay, I'll give an example. For example, the uh, line sizing. Let's make an exa a simple example. Line sizing, process line sizing, you know. Process defines the diameter of lines and shows this information on the PNIDs. Okay, how do they calculate the diameter? They use certain rules, certain criteria. It's linked to the velocity, to the uh, uh, some dynamic, uh, to sound, basically it's all linked to limits for sound and pressure drops, but pressure drops depends. 
uh, when, they, when it's uh, relevant, but in few cases, it's normally there is, it's not the criteria that uh, comes to the, the, it's not the data mining criteria, it is a noise. So they have some uh, rules, you know, of uh, meters per second, uh, rho v square or rho v, uh, yeah, rho v square. Okay, fine. They have, they have this criteria and they should issue this design criteria before they start to do the line sizing, okay? You will find that this is really the case. People don't always uh, issue, issue uh, design criteria specifications. Okay, um, so thank you for having done this exercise. By, uh, I just want to conclude and then we make a break. Uh, I just want to, you know, I've just mentioned that right now, design criteria specification, right? Design specification. In engineering, you'll find that there is, fortunately, a rather standardized vocabulary for many things. PNID uh, is uh, a mechanical data sheet. People know what it what it means. Okay, PFD. So, however, some words I used uh, not very rigorously, and specification is one of them. Can you uh, name different types? I mean, types different na nature of specifications, which. Which types of specifications do we find? Philosophies, yes, that's a good one. So a philosophy, yeah. What else? For example, fire and gas detection philosophy, isolation philosophy. Okay, what, what else? What other type? Which is, which is a, so that's one type, philosophies. Which, which, other type of document is called also the same name, specification. Yeah, equipment specification, so that's linked to materials, materials, equipment bulk, materials, so material specifications, what else? Yes, construction specifications. Okay. So you see, the same word is used to, for things completely different. There is philosophies. So there are, in general, philosophies, they are what? They are design specifications. They are specifications explaining how you will do the design. Then there are specifications linked to materials. Then there are specifications linked to works. All of them are called specifications, unfortunately. So it's, uh, even sometimes I've seen process data sheets called specification, even though it was a data sheet. Normally data sheet is Excel and the uh, specification is Word, but uh, you know, they, they did the, the other way around. So yeah, uh, so this, this last point, you know, there is basically, uh, let's say three types of specifications. No, no, not let's say there are three types of specification. You will find out. You find the design spec, which specifies how you do the design. Example: structural design spec. I'm going to leave twenty percent free space on the pipe racks for future. Right. That's it's. I specify how I carry my design. I'm going to have maximum what, one to three hundred deflection on the on the pipe rack. Okay, I specify how I what is the criteria I'm using in my design. Okay, so design specifications, material specs. Okay, this steel beam is going to be great, so and so. This is the steel beam I will use. Okay, and then works specification. Full penetration, 100% RT, blah, blah, blah. So, 
different, different uh, documents, but the same name.